you may now clutch your pearls because I'm doing it again, as I said I would. The conversation around religion continues. And as a matter of fact, we are going to be discussing when religion goes wrong and naturally we are focused on when religion goes wrong for women. Hello and welcome to Ladies Listen Up. I am your host, Gwendolyn G.R. Houston Jack. So religion. Okay, I already know that there are people who are going to hear the idea of even talking about it and turn off this episode. And that's okay. I'm perfectly fine with that. Understand that as a person who likes to talk to other people and really get into why we do what we do. This show was created to have a safe space for unapologetic conversations. We are going to discuss all the things. And this is not saying that you now need to look at everything you've ever known and question it. That is not the conversation. Trust my relationship with the Lord above is strong and tight. Never question. But of course, I didn't put my faith in man, so that probably explains why I feel the way I feel. So I am so excited that we have someone who is brave enough to share their experience in this conversation today. And so I want to welcome our special guest, and it is Peggy McCartha. Welcome, Peggy. Welcome. How are you? I am great. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, so before I get started, I want to make sure I introduce you to all the people who probably have, well, they may or may not have heard about you because you've been around for a little bit. You, you have a, a well-versed biography, as I like to say. Um, so let me just tell the people about Peggy MacArthur real quick. She is a certified professional photographer with over 30 years of experience. Okay, expert, we'll go ahead and call it. She is also <laughs> a creator. You know, she created the Headshot Strategist certification program. She also has Time Builders Community. She is a podcaster, a motivator, an empower, an activist. And now I get to get to the good stuff. She is the wife, mom, grandma, LGBTQ plus ally, lymphedema awareness spokesperson, and human civil rights advocate. My goodness. Welcome, Peggy McCartha. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm also a, a friend of G. I'm like a big fan of yours. So <laughs> it's an honor to be here. You know, let me say this before we get into this conversation. Let me say this, that um, it is... It's empowering, it really is, for you to come on and share your experience because I am aware. People talk about, you don't wanna touch this with a 10 foot pole. I get it. Religion can be ugly, it can be sticky, and people can be black and white about it, but the fact of the matter is, we are past due for conversations about a lot of what we do in our society, right? Politics, money, relationships, the whole nine yards. We're past it. So thank you for, coming here. You're going to share what you feel comfortable sharing. So I want to make sure that that is clear to everybody. And um, we now get to dive into when religion goes wrong. All right. So let me just start with something very basic, right? So I want people to get an idea as to who you are right? This is who you are. So just give us a quick review of your religious upbringing. Tell us about religion in your household. I know in last season, I shared that my mother is the minister. And I also shared when things went kind of wonky for me. So if you will, just give us a little bit of your background. 
Sure. Uh, I grew up in a very small farming community, like 900 people in our town. So very small community. And uh, my parents found religion when I was two years old. I had older siblings, uh, two sisters that are nine and 11 years older than me. So they were, you know, preteen, teenage uh, when my when my parents found religion. But I, you know, pretty much my whole life grew up in a very religious home. Uh, we, like I said, small town. So there was a church on every, every street corner. <laughs> and uh, uh, originally, uh, as a child, uh, we went to we kind of flopped back and forth from the Baptist church to mm. the Methodist church. Mm -hmm. But before we would go to church in the mornings, uh, my my mom would get me dressed, you know, because you have to wear a dress and the little black shoes with the leotards, you know, the whole thing every Sunday. And, <laughs> you know, I had long, long straight hair. And so it was always, you know, ah, you know, but she would set me in front of the TV. And and before we went to church, I had two hours of church TV as a child. So I listened to Kenneth Copeland Ministries mm -hmm. and um, um, um um, I just went blank. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, anyway, here in California, I totally went blank on the other evangelical minister that I'd listened to. And then we would go to the Methodist church or the, um, or the Baptist church, whoever, you know, whatever preacher they happened to like at that time. And that went on until I was about 10 years old. And then, um, a neighboring town had, had a, uh, I guess, uh, an outreach that they started on Monday mm -hmm. evenings. It was an evangelical faith, uh, holy roller type of a thing. And so we started going to that on Monday nights. And then my parents helped to establish a, a church uh, in, in our town. So I was literally just always raised in the mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. you know, uh, couldn't listen to secular music because that was devil music. <laughs> couldn't do, you know, never went to a school dance. You know, I, uh, I worked a lot and I was at church. I was either working or at church. Mm. Now I was also, um, a, I play the drums and loved rock and roll. I mean, I grew up in the seventies and eighties, so I loved that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to play Christian music and sneak around for any other kind <laughs> of music because any other music was, you know, the devil. And even as a kid, I always questioned, even though I really wanted to be a good girl, I wanted to be, yeah. you know, a, a little Christian girl. I always questioned you know, why, you know, people used to say Elvis Presley was evil. Now, why do you say his music is fine? Like I didn't, I, you know, why did, you know, when you were a kid, this was evil. Now you're telling me I can listen to it. So I always question things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I drove everyone crazy because I, I did question, even though everything about me wanted to go full in on this, I always needed to know why and how, and that's, ultimately probably what saved me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's what's funny about music. Now that you mention it, I know for us, Prince was not allowed. Um, mother never actually said it. And, but it was just one of those where you just really didn't play him. Michael Jackson was fine. He was safe, right? The Jackson five was safe. Prince on the other hand, pushed all the boundaries and was like, no, we're not. We're not doing any of that. And then, of course, when I got older, we could buy my own music. I was like, oh, OK, like, what's what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Like, I don't even understand. Um, but, you know, different times, different things. But yes, the whole idea of secular music and. Yeah, we're, we we really could do a whole show on just all the things a whole show, a whole do. show of that. When <laughs> when I came to the realization that Striper was literally stealing <laughs> the good music and putting new music, <laughs> new words to it. I was like, wait a minute. But, but yeah, <laughs> there's, there's so much room for that. But it's like, okay, let, let me just make sure we stay here. But same thing. It was this whole idea of these, um, these rules. Like, where did these rules come from? Like my grandmother would say, well, um, you're not supposed to cut your hair. That's in the Bible. And a woman's not supposed to, do. I was like, where is that? And are you serious right now? Like, and that even makes sense. Like none of it even makes sense. I'm like, but wait, what? You, you shouldn't play cards. You can't do this, and you can't drink alcohol. It's like, but they did somebody turn water into wine. I could have sworn that's one. Um, that's in there. <laughs> so you can't tell me that we can't drink. <laughs> so my dad's grand grandparents were Quaker Mennonite ministers. Mm. So my dad was raised in a Quaker church, mm -hmm. uh, Mennonite. So 
no makeup, no nail polish, no piercings, no, you know, women had long hair, women were submissive, you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when my sisters were never allowed to wear makeup and, you know, anything, but on the school bus, you know, they would put their makeup on (laughs) and like, don't tell mom and dad. And then, you know, after school, wash their face and come home. But by the time I came around, I think my parents had just like, they just didn't care anymore about that. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was very um, prevalent, like how, how a woman, you know, I, I always had long hair and, you know, at some point when I cut my hair, I think I was about 16, my dad did not speak to me for three days. Um, He came in to sit down for dinner and saw that I had short hair and he put his, his, play sitting down. He got up and he left and he would not even utter a word to me for three days. He was so angry about air. Hair. Hair. That's that's a perfect segue because I want to talk about like you as a young adult. Did the beliefs you had early on impact any life decisions you made as you were coming into your own, like, so you were going like from the teenage years, but your sisters are sneaking on the makeup and whatnot until you're becoming like the 20 something. Did those beliefs impact your life decisions and how you felt about yourself? A hundred percent, every decision. Um, I, uh, like I said, grew up in a small town and I had, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be a photographer. I knew I wanted to, to leave the small town and uh, I didn't date anyone in, in high school because there was no way. I mean, I'd seen so many people, they date someone, they, they get stuck in this town. <laughs> and I remember my mom coming to me uh, when I was a senior in high school and she was like, are you a lesbian? I'm going to pray that devil out of you because you should be engaged by now. I, I'm 17 years old and she's angry that I'm not engaged. Um <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I did get out of that town. Um, I moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma and went to Rama Bible College, Kenneth Hagin's Bible College. And and it's funny as I'm saying these things, because please know that that this is exclusive. This is the first time I've ever spoke publicly about any of this. Aww. Most of the people that know me don't know um, this part of my life because mm-hmm. um, there's so much trauma in, connected to it. But uh, I did go to Raymond Bible College while I was interning with a photographer to learn photography and how to run a photography business. Uh, So I I was doing that Mm -hmm. and I met a boy and, you know, we had sex and that was it. Like, um, we obviously have to get married. There's like no question because we're in sin and the only, I mean, I'm, I'm basically like blacklisted for anybody in the whole world. Nobody's ever going to want to touch me or look at me because I have had Mm -hmm. sex. I have fornicated and I am now dirty and bad and evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, very soon after that, he started uh, physically abusing me physically. um, uh, And I still married him. Two years of abuse before we were married. Uh, Because, you know, that was that was my punishment for being a sinner. I felt I deserved that because, you know, I let him. So therefore I deserved um, this. So um, after we got married, um, then uh, he ended up uh, going to uh, Bible school and we moved to the Navajo Indian Reservation and we worked with uh, children and teenagers. uh, And we had a, a really big ministry there and we were under... Um, the biggest televangelist ministry in uh, in in the world. Mm. Uh, we were kind of like we called him our dad. He was our spiritual dad. Our kids called him mm. grandpa, and we were you know not just under the ministry, but we were in the family. We were you know uh, really really highly involved, and no one knew that I was being physically abused. I mean, I had I think eight broken ribs. Um, <sighs> I had been left unconscious, left alone and woke up, you know, hours later by myself in a pool of blood. Like, I mean, these things were happening on a regular basis. Uh, Meanwhile, he's out on the pulpit telling people, you know, how to live. And uh, so um, many years 
Well, let me let me go back and add this because I I, I do want to bring this up. Hmm. Um, when I was only 19 years old, um, our nephew uh, started staying with us, and then eventually we adopted him. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that obviously my oldest, um, but not uh, not by birth. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, when he was about 14, 15, uh, he he liked to shave his legs and uh, wear girls' clothes, and he got caught. And it was I. I honestly don't know his sexuality or his gender identity because no one ever asked. Mm. No one ever asked. We just like, you are a sinner. We're going to pray this out of you. We, you know, this is just terrible. Like nobody can know that you're, you're an evil. And he just wanted to be a good kid. He, mm-hmm. he loved God. He loved the church. He loved all of this. And, but he was not allowed to express himself at all. Mm. And, uh, um, this, this went on and and I was, I was really struggling with this because being, Mm. being raised in a small community, being raised in in a church, being, you know, always surrounded by this type of thinking. Mm -hmm. And then to have somebody in my family that I'm like, this kid isn't trying to sin. This kid is just, this is who this, like, this is who he is and what is going on. And so that's when I started really questioning, like, Mm what in, you know, what is going on here? And, uh, um, in 2002, early 2002, um, was the worst abuse, um, to date. Uh, he actually took a rifle and shoved it down my throat and said he was going to blow my brains out and then turned it on him and said, Oh, you want the, you want me to do this? And then instead took the, uh, the, um, the, 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 not the barrel, the, the arm piece or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, hit me in the face and dislocated my, my skull broke and dislocated my skull, gave me a severe concussion and whiplash. And, uh, about that same time he had punched our oldest. And that was the first time he'd ever uh, been physical with the kids. Mm. And then he just walking down the hall, shoved our eight year old on his butt. And I was like, that's it. Like, I've got to get out of here or me and the kids are, are actually going to die. Like I need to leave. So I called this big minister who, you know, I thought of his family and I said, Hey, um, I need you to know this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm actually scared for my life and I, I have to leave. And I just need you to know that I'm, I'm leaving. And, um, he said, no, you can't leave. Um, we make too much money off of the Navajo reservation mission. Mm-hmm. You can't go. And I said, but I'm, you know, and he says, oh, we'll pray for him. It's fine. We'll pray for him. I said, I've been praying for him for 13 years now. I need to go. And, uh, uh, he said, no, you can't. Um, he's like, I'll tell you what. I'll give you some money. It'll be a private bank account. You can have your own money and you, you know, and I was like, money, what, what is, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid for my life. I don't need money. And he said, you cannot leave. You are like the spokes, you know, person for this, Mm -hmm. you know, people Mm -hmm. love you. They love your energy. You cannot go. And I was like, oh, well I I can. (laughs) And he's like, if you do, um, you will lose everything and we will, you know, ruin your name. And I was like, okay. Um, so, uh, I loaded up the kids and, uh, moved to Southern California. Uh, and we lived in a 28 foot trailer in, uh, in a trailer court in a, like a camp campground mm-hmm. trailer uh, for, for a long time. And that's when I was really questioning everything. My dad always told me when I was a kid, he would say, God gave you a brain. Think about it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's why I did always question things. Mm -hmm. But it was like everybody that I thought loved me and cared about me and the message that I thought I was bringing to help people, I was like, is this just a game for money? Yeah. Is this like, yeah. what, what do you mean? You know, why, you know, I'm, I'm a dollar sign to someone like it. I, I just couldn't fathom because I wasn't in, I wasn't doing what I was doing for money. I honestly mm-hmm. believed mm-hmm. 
what I was being told. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, in hindsight, the big red flags are don't question the prophet of God. Don't mm -hmm. question, you know, you should always question everyone. Jesus questioned, the, <laughs> the, you know, Jesus questioned the Pharisees. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should question everything. And, and at any time, if anyone is saying like, you know, oh, just trust me, this is what God showed me. Like, yeah. mm, no, no. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, wow. Um, it's a lot to wrap your head around, right? Because this isn't, like, I know I've seen, we've seen documentaries, people have talked about what goes what goes on beyond, um, behind those closed doors, right? Like, we've, we've seen those documentaries and things, but to have you recount the abuse in your household and how you, like a lot of others, have sought out a resolution and help, and then to be told, eh, well, we'll just pray about it because... You know, you're like, I've been praying for 13 years, man. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, it's one of those where you have to say this, this cannot be the life that the good Lord has chosen for us, for me to like, sit here and do this, right? And experience it, have my kids experience it too. Like, this cannot be it. So I want to switch really quick. And I'm going to let us get into this very last topic here, because I do want to investigate the life that we are living religiously. And you mentioned um, how your father said, hey, does that make sense? And that we should question. So this, this is one of those where I'm going to say do the work, but for all the viewers, you have to decide what that work looks like. Okay, so clearly I heard the turning point for when it went wrong for you. And there were some signs we followed because this is the letter of the law. And there was a point where you said, okay, this, this cannot continue. It can't. So the question for you is this, because we are not advising viewers to walk away from their current religious beliefs and everything they've ever known, not asking it whatsoever. That is not it. That is not what we're about. We are about giving people who may be in a place of question mark. I'm having a question mark moment right now. This is what that conversation is, because we all have our own experience with whatever church and everything else. And that's we're respecting that. So this is not some sort of, I'm going to advise you to go against. No, I'm not. I don't have time for that. But for those who currently have a question mark about their current state of religious belief or their church they're attending or something they may have been told, what advice do you have from your own experience? What would you tell those people? Faith without works is dead. Um, God never was, you know, I prayed for protection. I prayed for all these things for years, but nothing ever happened until I stood up and made a change in my life. And I think that, that even though I left religion, um, I don't think I, I left society's idea of religion because there are, I believe laws um, that apply to the universe, the universal laws, and they're true. But part of that is that you have to get up and do something. Um, when somebody says, oh, I'm going to pray for you, I'm like, okay, <laughs> go ahead. I like your prayers aren't going to change anything in my life. Mm -hmm. um, because A, most of the time when people say they're going to pray for me, they're not. It's just like a, a, a popular thing to say. Like, um, and, and B, um, I'm, I have control over my life and the direction that it goes. And so, you know, I am the one that has to stand up and make that decision. Do I stay here? Mm -hmm. Um, or do I stand up and I, do I go in a way that I'm going to be able to live a happy, fulfilled, mm -hmm. um, prosperous, amazing life, or do I stay here in the dark 
and continue to take all of this on because someone else told me to. So I, I, I think my advice would be to realize that, that it is your life. It is your life that God gave you to live. So go live it and, and make, make the life that you want and, and be happy because it's okay. You can be happy. You can have a good life. You are not inherently bad. You are not a sinner. You are not evil. You are a human living a human experience. And sometimes bad things happen and sometimes good things happen, but you are a human living a human experience and it's really a cool experience. So go out and live it. That's great advice. And I, I, I couldn't help but think when you were saying, when people say, I'll pray for you, um, I immediately think about all of the mass shootings we've had in our society, so much so that, you know, I don't believe I'm desensitized, but when it happens, I'm not also in shock and awe anymore. And when people who can make a change and can take action simply say, we're sending our thoughts and prayers, I'm like, clearly you're not. Because your thoughts and mm -mm. prayers can only go so far. Perhaps if you change some laws, we might get some real, some real difference here, right? Some real change. Um, so I understand that whole point of people just say it because it sounds like the thing to say in a certain moment. But it like, is it is it really there? Is 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 the is the truth? Like, are you really? setting up a couple of prayers before this person or is it just, oh, some prayers and I'll pray for you. And I'll, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Now I do believe that there are people who sit down and send up as many as they can. And then you have like your politician who's like, we're sending our thoughts and prayers to the family of the parents who have lost their nine year old and eight year old because you know, let me well, not do that. Also, let me not yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, just well, say, sometimes just also when, when people send their prayers or say they're going to pray for you, it's, it's, it's not that they're praying for you. It's a, it's a type of manipulation. Mm. Like, mm. Hey, you are good. I'm going to pray that you'll be better and, and yeah. do the things that God, that I, that I decided that God wants you to do. Yeah believe the way I believe. And if you don't believe the way I believe, then you're inherently a sinner. And so I'm going to pray for you. And that's, that's just manipulation. That's yeah. literally the definition of taking the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. 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 I never, I never thought about that. Like you have, that's, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. If you, if you think about the context behind the statement, it does, it does shift the way it's like, wait a minute. Hmm. But this is why we invited you here, Peggy. I got to tell you, uh, man, you know, and it's it's one of those places where you're thinking clearly 30 minutes. <laughs> we, <laughs> it, it, it's not enough to get into where we where we might want to go in the future. Um, but I cannot help but thank you again for just even sharing what you have shared today. Like that's that's huge. And I'm for all the viewers who are watching, I'm sure they're like, OK, I've probably had a thought or two, or I've experienced something similar. And I'm just trying to figure out like how to navigate these waters very much so. So Peggy, thank you so much for giving us this time. And it's clearly we need to investigate some more perhaps in the future. But for those who are wanting to investigate your photography uh, program, or maybe even connect with you, how can our viewers connect with you? Well, thank you. First of all, I wanted just to, uh, in the beginning of the show, you said time builders, it's time benders. Um, and I know it was just a slip up yeah. of the tongue because you're, you're part of the time benders. So I knew, you know, but, um, but yeah, we have an amazing group of professional photographers that reach around the world. And, um, if you are in the LA area, I would love to have you come into my studio and let me take your headshots. But either way, I would love for you to set up a chat with me. So you can go to headshotstrategist.com backslash, backslash let's chat and get on my calendar. I would love to uh, meet and talk to you. Sweet. Again, thank you so much. And uh, yes, I am part of the Time Benders community. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the tongue does what it does. <laughs>
I, I am always right there with you. I always say the, the random things. Oh my goodness. So again, thank you all for tuning in today. We cannot thank Peggy enough for being so brave to share her story. And tell, I'm, I'm going to say this for the last time, and I know people are like, it's not that. Yes, it is. When you decide to be vulnerable and share a part of your story that, as Peggy has shared with us, has never shared before, that is not an easy thing. It is by no means easy. So we are not going to even pretend that that is not a huge step and something that is very brave, right? So I want to thank her for that. And as I always say, give yourself the space and grace to grow and learn. See you guys soon.